Good morning and welcome to the fourth session in our course on Rome from Founding Legends to Mistress of the Mediterranean. Today I want to talk about the First Punic War, or the first of Rome's big wars with Carthage, 264 to 241 BC. That rather interesting cover slide image I will discuss in due course. It's something I generated with my artificial intelligence engine because once again I couldn't find a decent image anywhere else on the internet so I thought I'd make my own. Today we will talk about the First Punic War and I've described this as the greatest war of the ancient world. Quite often when you read about wars in the ancient world the historian will say, and this was a big war in which great victories were achieved and terrible defeats were inflicted on the enemy. And then you discover that this was really nothing more than a slightly enlarged gang fight in which a few hundred men turn up, fight for a couple of hours and go away leaving a few dozen dead. Now, it's very sad for the few dozen dead but it's not something that you would describe as a war, particularly when the parties to this war are cities with a population of about ten or 20,000 people and the territory involved is hardly bigger than an English county. That is what you often find in wars between the Greek states. But this war, the first war between Rome and Carthage, can be described as a war with a capital W. It was a gigantic war that went on for 23 years. It involved the total resources of two large and powerful Mediterranean states. Many of the records set in the First Punic War have never been broken. The largest naval engagement in history in terms of the men who took part the greatest naval disaster in history in terms of the men lost. There was, for example, a time when a Roman fleet, a victorious Roman fleet, was hit by an unexpected storm and it went straight down, carrying 100,000 men with it. Very large armies, very large navies, repercussions throughout the entire Western Mediterranean world and indeed throughout the Eastern Mediterranean world it is a giant war, and it's something that you might even care to describe as a total war, so far as it did eventually involve all the resources of the parties to the war. Here is a map showing the locations of Rome and Carthage, and they do face each other straight across the Mediterranean, and they had faced each other for a very long time. I will describe their early relations and the causes, the immediate and the long-term causes of their war in a moment. However, what I've given here on this first slide is a brief timeline of events in the war. This is not an entire timeline that would fill page after page, but these are what I think are the most significant events in the war. 264 BC, and it's always worth bearing these dates in mind, but 264 BC, the outbreak of the war. 263, the Roman victory at Agrigentum, which is significant because it is a victory the Carthaginians didn't expect, but it's a victory that the Romans were entirely qualified to win. Then the war begins to go out of control between 262 and 260 BC with the beginning of naval engagements. And after this, the war moves mostly away from the land to the sea. Most of the war is a long stalemate in Sicily and unsuccessful landings in Africa. But the main action of the war moves to sea and this is something that no one had expected at the outset of the war. But the thing about wars is that they are always unexpected. That's one reason why so many very clever politicians avoid war so far as they can. It's fools who rush into wars saying, let's fight them because we know that we can win.
The Germans refer to it as rolling the iron dice of war. The moment you declare a war, you don't know what will happen next. And, well, the Germans have had some experience of rolling those iron dice and getting an outcome that they didn't expect and that they certainly didn't like. You then have what I describe as this long stalemate between 247 and 242 BC, a significant stalemate, as that is what wore the Carthaginians down. You have the final battle of the war, the Battle of the Aigartes Islands, followed by the end of the war, and the Treaty of Lutatius, in which the Romans got everything they asked for. Although you have terms like, this is a Carthaginian peace, that is, a peace imposed on a defeated enemy so harsh that it will lead to a future war. The Treaty of Versailles was often referred to, is often referred to, as a Carthaginian peace. You'll find if you look at the Treaty of Lutatius that the Romans were rather modest in their demands. They came back a few years later for a second bite and got rather more. But even so, if you take those two treaties together, the Romans demanded surprisingly little at the end of this giant war, and Carthage very much survived to fight another day. So there is a timeline and an overview of this war. Let's look at the sources. I've been saying so far, we don't know what happened, we don't know if this person even existed. This story probably records something that happened. There is some basis in fact for this particular story, but we don't really know. For this war, for the First Punic War, we do have good historical sources, and our main source for the war is that man on the right, the Greek historian Polybius. He was a great historian. He was an entirely competent historian in modern terms, Polybius's approach to history was, so far as possible, to observe the events for himself. Polybius was there beside Scipio Africanus in 146 BC at the end of the Third Punic War when Carthage was totally destroyed. Polybius was there beside the Roman general watching the city burn and watching the terrible things that happened in the last days of Carthage. When Polybius could not directly observe the events for himself, he would interview the participants to those events. He would go around the Mediterranean world, sitting people down and asking them questions, and then incorporating that into his history. When that was not possible, and for the First Punic War, Polybius is writing about events a hundred years before his own time, he used whatever documentary sources he could find. Again, he would travel around the Mediterranean world, persuading various governments to let him into their archives. He did a lot of archive research, reading documents, looking at transcripts of debates trying so far as possible to get at the original sources. There are people who believe that his account of the First Punic War is biased, and there is, of course, always bias in history. Polybius was entirely pro-Roman in his outlook. I'll talk about the Greek view of the Romans in a moment. So Polybius obviously right from a pro-Roman perspective, and this has led people to insist that his entire account of the wars with Carthage is biased. However, on the occasions when we've been able to check Polybius, we've found that he is entirely accurate. For example, naval archaeologists have been recovering bits of sunken ships from battles described by Polybius, and it does seem that his description accords with the archaeological evidence. Also, what he says is broadly confirmed by the other rather fragmentary sources that we have. Our disadvantage, so far as there is one, is that we don't have any Carthaginian sides to this war. 
there is no reason to suppose that the Carthaginians had a secular body of literature in the way that the Greeks had and the Romans later on acquired. That is, there's no reason to suppose that there was any body of historical output by the Carthaginians which we could, if we had it, use beside that of the Greeks and the Romans. The Greek achievement in history and in secular literature in particular is unique to the ancient world. It's something that was imitated by the Romans and then imitated by ourselves, but we really have no reason to believe that other peoples had that degree of interest in writing about the past. But when the Romans took Carthage in 146 BC, they burned the city, they destroyed the city, they ripped it apart. There are modern claims that they sowed the site of Carthage with salt. That doesn't appear to have been the case, but there is no doubt the Romans comprehensively destroyed the city. Because of its position, the Romans later rebuilt it, and it became the second most important Latin city in the Mediterranean world after Rome itself. And it continued as that until the Arabs abandoned the city in the 7th century. But we don't have the Carthaginian side for this war. All we have is Polybius and other Greek writers and Roman writers like Livy and Florus and Eutropius who largely follow Polybius. So we have only one side for this war. But we have no good reason to suppose that Polybius was in any sense untruthful. It is possible to be a biased historian, but still to tell the truth to the best of your ability so that you can set aside that historian's bias and form your own opinion. We have an account for this war written by a first-rate historian, and we do have a large number of later, often fragmentary sources which fill in the gaps. There are certain gaps which can't be filled in. Something that I do regret when we look at the historical sources for the First Punic War is that nobody thought it worth writing a diplomatic history of the war. I will come to this later. We do have a few scattered references here and there which suggests that this was not simply a war fought with armies and with ships. It was also fought with various kinds of diplomatic outreach. Unfortunately, it is not possible to reconstruct anything amounting to a diplomatic history. If you look at the history of European wars, the diplomatic manoeuvrings, the secret treaties, the bribes, the promises made... These are at least as important as the actual fighting. If you look at a history of the First World War, most of the conventional accounts of that war are diplomatic history. The fighting in the trenches is almost an aside. Much more important, the historians believe, than the casualty lists for the Battle of the Somme are the well, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which divided the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East between Britain and France, or various treaties promising this to the Italians and this to the Russians and everything else. But that particular dimension of this war, and I do believe that this dimension did exist, is something that we're unable to reconstruct. Other sources, apart from Polybius... You have Livy, the great Roman historian. Though he relied on Polybius, he added very little of his own. Diodorus Siculus, a Greek historian of the 1st century BC, he was a Sicilian and he does record a certain amount of information that you won't find in Polybius. Appian, some of whose history is missing, but there are many very interesting snippets about events in this war. And then Cassius Dio, another first-rate Greek historian. Unfortunately, most of the relevant books of his history are missing. The, the work survives in fragments. 
and mostly covers the first few centuries of the imperial period. Other sources, inscriptions, very important things not to be overlooked, archaeological evidence, that often throws a flood of light on events that are not entirely clear otherwise, and then you have empirical evidence where you reconstruct Roman and Carthaginian warships and see what they can do. How fast can they go? How much baggage can they carry? What sort of kinetic force do they have when they ram each other? All of those things are very useful to know, and a lot of work has been done in the past century on this. So this, to summarise, is not like the Roman Revolution, where we can be reasonably assured that there was a revolution, but the accounts we have of it are decidedly fanciful, and it's not simply a set of interesting or inspiring stories. Horatius at the Bridge, Gaius Musius Scaevola, Camillus and the School Teacher, which may have some basis in factual truth, but we are completely unable to know. This is a war that is recorded by a first-class historian, and the events in this war are reasonably certain. That being said, let's turn to Carthage, the great enemy. Carthage was a Semitic city. It was built, the conventional date for its founding is 814 BC, which may be true but probably isn't, but it was founded sometime in the 9th century BC. When the Assyrians invaded most of the Near East, or rather most of the Middle East, in the 9th and 8th and 7th centuries, they were a rather frightening people. Many people took one look at them and ran for it. Many of the Semitic merchants, the Phoenician merchants, in places like Tyre and Sidon and Beirut, preferred rather than live under Assyrian rule, to get into their ships and sail as far away as possible. And that may have been the beginning of the establishment of Carthage in the western Mediterranean. A good location, a very good commercial and strategic location, and also such a long way from the Assyrians that they would never be able to come after the colonists. Carthage is a Phoenician or a Semitic settlement in the western Mediterranean. It was, from the very beginning, a trading nation, and as it grew in wealth and power, it conceived its strategy as achieving and maintaining exclusive control of the seas in the Mediterranean, to this end, the Carthaginians put a lot of effort into conquering the various large and small islands in the western Mediterranean and in founding trading settlements all across North Africa to the west of Carthage itself and eventually on the coast of Spain. The Carthaginians also began to penetrate inland in North Africa and Spain, and to build up a substantial empire. Like Rome, Carthage was a republic. Like Rome, it was not a democracy. But whereas Rome was a largely agricultural oligarchy, the senatorial aristocracy that managed affairs in Rome drew its wealth overwhelmingly, or perhaps exclusively, from the land. A senator, indeed, was not allowed to engage in commercial activities if it was known that a senator was importing pottery from Greece. He might, or perhaps would, be expelled from the Senate and regarded as having let his order down, whereas the ruling elite in Carthage was a commercial oligarchy. The people who managed policy in Carthage were traders or they were people who had invested very heavily in overseas trade. The Carthaginians were a rather strange people. They scandalised the Greeks and Romans. I'll come to that in a moment. 
They had a partiality for human sacrifice and also for extreme torture. And this is not to say that the Greeks and Romans were particularly gentle. They could be as gory as anybody else on occasion. I'd also say that the gladiatorial games that became increasingly popular in Rome after the Second Punic War began as a human sacrifice ritual before it was commercialised. And even the Greeks, on the quiet, were not averse to the occasional spot of human sacrifice and even ritual cannibalism. But this scale, the extravagant nature of the Carthaginian human sacrifices were something that scandalised the Greeks and Romans, or that were a good excuse, a good stick with which to beat the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians also had a settled custom of crucifying unlucky military leaders. If you were a Greek or a Roman military leader and you lost a battle, you might be expected to fall on your sword, but if you didn't do that, you could go back. You might be put on trial for incompetence, you might be fined, you might be exiled, but on the whole, the Greeks and Romans did not execute their unlucky military leaders. The Carthaginians did. On the one hand, this may have had the effect of encouraging the others. On the other hand, in at least one case, it was not in the best interests of the Carthaginian state to hold this threat of execution over its military leaders. Turning to the human sacrifices, here is the artificial intelligence image that I generated. The cover slide, let's go back to it. So far as we can tell, and there are various accounts of this, on certain occasions, we're not entirely sure what kind of occasions, but on certain occasions, the leading Carthaginians would assemble in the temple of Bel Marduk in Carthage. They would then place their young children, three and four and five, that sort of age, they'd place them in the arms of a brass idol. The arms were downward sloping over a furnace, and so the children would roll down the brass arms of this idol into the furnace. The parents would then dance around the temple to the sound of drums and flutes to drown out the screams of their dying children. You have Milton, Book One of Paradise Lost, uh, let me think. First Moloch, horrid king besmeared with blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears, though for the noise of drums and timbrels loud, their children's cries unheard that pass through fire. So the Carthaginian sacrifices are things which have survived in the historical record and make their way into Book One of Paradise Lost. But here is a quote from a Greek historian called Cletarchus, who wrote in the 3rd century BC, Out of reverence for Cronos, the Phoenicians, and especially the Carthaginians, whenever they seek to obtain some great favour, vow one of their children, burning it as a sacrifice to the deity. If they are especially eager to gain success, there stands in their midst a bronze statue of Cronos, its hands extended over a bronze brazier, the flames of which engulf the child. When the flames fall upon the body, the limbs contract, and the open mouth seems almost to be laughing, until the contracted body slips quietly into the brazier. Thus it is that the grin is known as sardonic laughter, since they die laughing. There were a number of 20th century historians who insisted that all of this was Greek and Roman propaganda and that the Carthaginians never did anything so monstrous. But we have discovered large numbers of clay jars containing the charred remnants of children. Some people then tried to claim that these were the burials of plague victims, but then DNA was extracted from the charred fragments, and they were all male. 
it's rather unlikely that the only children who died in a plague and were buried were male. These are the remnants of the child sacrifices. There is no reasonable cause to suspect that this was Greek and Roman propaganda. So the Carthaginians, rich, powerful, and profoundly alien. The Romans didn't worry about that because Rome had land-based ambitions. The Romans, so far as they had any ambitions that could be stated in their early history, was to take over the whole of Italy and to unite it under the leadership of Rome. If you had suggested to a Roman in about 300 BC, why don't you conquer Greece, why don't you conquer Egypt, you'd have got a funny look and been told, no, we're not doing that. And there are treaties between Rome and Carthage. There was a treaty signed in 508 BC, and we can't be entirely sure about its terms or its existence, but there was a treaty signed in 348 BC, and that is within the historic period. The Romans and the Carthaginians for many centuries enjoyed completely friendly relations The Carthaginians were interested in trade, and Italy was a place well worth trading with. They were interested in islands, they were interested in trading bases, not in large-scale territorial acquisition. So the Romans and the Carthaginians knew of each other, they enjoyed friendly relations, and their ambitions did not cross each other. Indeed, In the 270s, when King Pyrrhus invaded Italy at the behest of the Greeks in Tarento, the Romans needed a fleet at one point so that they could cross a body of water. They asked the Carthaginians for help, and the Carthaginians immediately obliged. The Carthaginians regarded this Greek incursion into southern Italy as bad for their trade, and they saw that their own interest was entirely aligned with the interests of Rome in expelling Pyrrhus from Italy. So, for a long period, Rome and Carthage enjoyed good diplomatic relations, very friendly commercial relations as well. The main problem was that the Greeks and Carthaginians hated each other. The Greeks hated the Carthaginians for a number of reasons, The main reason was, remember, the Carthaginians wanted to close the entirety of the Western Mediterranean to any trade in ships other than Carthaginian, an early equivalent of the English Navigation Acts. If a Greek trading ship were caught in the Western Mediterranean, it was sunk. If there were any survivors, they were taken back to Carthage and tortured to death in various gory ways. The Greeks hated this. The Greeks hated to see their trade in the Western Mediterranean shut out. And the Greeks who were settled in Italy and in the Western Mediterranean were frightened that the Carthaginians would take them over. The Carthaginians had a long-standing interest in the conquest of Sicily, which had been heavily settled by the Greeks. Sicily was a site for many hundreds of years for wars between the Greeks and the Carthaginians. So the Greeks did not like the Carthaginians. They were commercial rivals, and the Greeks were also rather frightened of the ways of the Carthaginians. What brought the Romans and the Carthaginians into conflict? The first is geography. The Carthaginians in the 3rd century BC got lucky in their conquest of Sicily. They rolled over the Greeks after several hundred years of stiff resistance, and the Carthaginians took over the city of Messina, You can stand on the mountain above Messina and you can look straight across to Italy. It's about five miles away. It also meant that the Romans, who had recently conquered the whole of southern Italy, could now look across the Straits of Messina from their side and see the Carthaginian warships sailing into and out of the harbour in Messina. When you have two great powers, and Carthage was a great power, 
Rome now was a great power. When you have two great powers with a close border, there will be a risk of war. There will be something that will trigger a conflict, and this will spread. You can almost talk about an historical rule in that respect. Great powers do not like to border on other great powers. When they do, you have a cold war and sometimes a hot war. So the geographical facts that the Romans now controlled the whole of southern Italy and the Sicilians controlled Sicily, where it was closer to Italy, brought them into potential conflict. And then there is the influence of the Greeks. The Greeks were a decidedly snooty people. Yes, let's call them that. They were a snooty people. They regarded all non-Greeks as inferior, and quite often they would refer to them as barbarians. They would call them barbarians. You didn't need to be a savage running round with tattoos on your face and butter smeared in your hair to be a barbarian as far as the Greeks were concerned. You simply needed not to speak Greek. The Romans didn't speak Greek, and so they were at least potentially barbarians. The Greeks looked down on the Romans. At the same time, two important facts. The first is that by the beginning of the 3rd century BC, the Romans had conquered all of the Greek cities in the south of Italy. The Greeks found themselves under Roman government. The second thing to bear in mind is that the Greeks and Romans were kindred peoples. They spoke languages which were reasonably close. Indeed, nowadays, if somebody wants to learn Greek, my advice is go and study Latin for a year. You'll find Greek much easier after that. If you learn Greek, that's a way into Latin. If you learn Latin, that's a way into Greek. The languages are reasonably close, and they became closer over time because of mutual influence. The Greeks and the Romans worshipped broadly the same gods. They were Indo-European peoples, and it was possible to match up the Greek gods to the Roman gods. It's called syncretism. They had similar ways. They had similar outlooks. The Romans looked down on the Greeks as rather soft, luxurious people, the Romans certainly didn't approve of the lack of team spirit among the Greeks, the fact that they were perfectly willing to stab each other in the back and sell each other out to the Romans. The Romans used that, but they didn't admire it. And as far as the Greeks were concerned, the Romans were a rather rough, barbarous people. But by the 3rd century BC, the Greeks had, even if they didn't want to admit it to themselves, made a final choice. They were not able in the Western Mediterranean to remain completely independent. They had to choose which of the two great powers would be their overlord. The Greeks looked at the Carthaginians, they looked at the Romans, and they chose the Romans. And later on, in Roman history, the Greeks in the East made a similar choice. They were faced with a similar choice, and they made the same choice. The Greeks in the East had to choose between the Parthians as their overlords and the Romans, and again, the Greeks, perhaps reluctantly, but they finally made the choice of the Romans. As soon as the Romans had the Greeks into their harem of subject peoples, they fell immediately under Greek cultural influence. Very difficult not to do that. And something that the Greeks impressed on the Romans was that the Carthaginians were a rather nasty people who could not under any circumstances be trusted. So you have the geographical fact that the Romans and the Carthaginians were facing each other across the Straits of Messina, and then you have the continual drip feed of propaganda from the Greeks that the Carthaginians could not be trusted, and if the Romans didn't take action first, there would be Carthaginian fleets raiding the coast of Italy, 
and Carthaginian armies fighting their way through southern Italy. So you have the growth of suspicion between Rome and Carthage. It all sounds rather like the beginning of the First World War, doesn't it? Where Britain and Germany start out as solid allies and end up fighting one of the greatest wars in history, but that is what happens. There is a map showing the Western Mediterranean at the beginning of the First Punic War. The Romans have that red area. They are the masters of Italy. The Carthaginians have that grey area, and I wouldn't put too much faith in those grey areas. Quite often, the Carthaginian presence was limited to a string of trading bases on the coast. But this is broadly the shape of the Western Mediterranean. Carthage is supreme on sea and in commerce and in the islands, and Rome is supreme within Italy, and they are facing each other across the Straits of Messina. The correlation of forces, and this is something that is very important, the Romans were absolutely dominant in Italy, which is a compact territory. It had at this time a large and rapidly growing population, and except in the Greek areas, indeed the Greek areas eventually came under that pressure, but except in the Greek areas, Italy increasingly spoke Latin, and the people of Italy increasingly saw themselves as broadly Roman, even if at this time they did not all have Roman citizenship. The Romans had close and friendly relations with the Greeks in southern Italy. They also had friendly relations with most of the Greek settlements in the western Mediterranean. At the same time, the Romans had no navy and no experience of war or diplomacy outside of Italy. Carthage absolutely dominant on the seas of the Western Mediterranean, a large network of naval and commercial bases throughout North Africa and Spain. The Carthaginians, I've said, were hated and feared by the Greeks of Italy and Spain. They were also envied by the other commercial powers of the East, the other Phoenician trading powers in the East, Tyre and Sidon and so on, had no particular love for the Carthaginians, even though they were kindred peoples. They were commercial rivals. The Carthaginians were also limited in their population. They had a very limited population hinterland in North Africa, and they were generally hated by the people of North Africa, by the subject peoples who were not Carthaginians. They were hated for their pride and their rapacity. This meant that the Carthaginians, until close to the end of their history, were never able to raise large native armies. Instead, they were rich from the proceeds of commerce, and they used their resources to raise, and sometimes to pay, large mercenary armies. So you have two great powers in the Western Mediterranean, completely unlike in their resources. The outbreak of the war... That's rather complex, and I will give a brief overview of it. When Pyrrhus invaded Italy in the 270s BC, he brought a large mercenary army with him. When he withdrew, some of those mercenaries stayed in Italy. They didn't find Italy entirely welcoming, and so they crossed into Sicily, and they conquered the city of Messina. They expelled the original inhabitants of Messina and they took it over. They inhabited Messina. It was a kind of pirate base. The Carthaginians didn't like this and they pressed the one independent Greek state in Sicily, that is Syracuse, to take action against the Mamertines. That's the name of these people who took over Messina. The Syracusans did a fairly good job, and in extremis, the Mamertines appealed to Carthage for help, saying, if you help us, you can have Messina, which is a useful trading base. The Mamertines also appealed to Rome for help. 
This meant that the Romans and the Carthaginians were both invited into this part of Sicily, and neither side would have wanted the other side to take up that invitation, but that meant that each side felt obliged to take up the invitation before the other one did. And so it's a small matter, a small local matter, of some mercenaries turned pirate who take over a city in Sicily and then make trouble for their neighbours. But, well, the First World War started because of a political assassination in a place where almost nobody had heard of. And so the First Punic War came about from a dispute in and about Messina. When the Mamertines appealed to the Romans for help, there was a deadlock in the Senate. Many senators said, no, we're not going outside of Italy. We've got Italy. That's all we want. We stay put. If the Carthaginians want to get involved in this, that's their business. But a very small majority was inclined to think of the military glory and, of course, the booty involved in fighting a small, limited war in Sicily. When the Senate couldn't entirely agree, the matter was thrown open to the Assembly, and the Assembly was persuaded to send a Roman army across the Straits of Messina into Sicily. And so the Romans invaded Sicily. The Carthaginians were not at first worried about this. Their experience was that war in Sicily was enormously expensive and always settled down into a stalemate. They didn't bother opposing the Roman crossing from Italy into Sicily. They could have sent a fleet to stop the Romans from getting out of Italy, but they couldn't be bothered. The Carthaginian strategy was to let the Romans wear themselves down for a bit, and then the Romans would come to their senses, and there would be an amicable settlement. If that wasn't possible, or if it took slightly longer than expected, The Carthaginians expected that this would be a naval war. They would rely on their overwhelming naval superiority. They would tie the Romans down. They would wear the Romans down and wait for the Romans to see sense. In the meantime, if there were any battles to be fought, they would be in Sicily. It would be mercenary armies. The Carthaginians could then carry on exactly as before with their commercial operations in the western Mediterranean. This was a small war, and the Carthaginians did not plan for anything else. However, the Romans did invade Sicily. They got across. The Carthaginians missed a chance when they allowed the Romans to cross the Straits of Messina. Immediately, the Romans took Messina and put it under Roman control. The Romans then marched south and they forced Syracuse to join as allies in a war against Carthage. The Romans then moved very quickly against the main Carthaginian military and naval base in Sicily, Agrigento in the south, which in those days was called Acragas. The Carthaginians now began to realise that this was a larger war than they had anticipated, so they raised a large mercenary army. They landed it in Sicily, near to Agrigento, and they expected that they would chase off the Romans because the Romans were at the extreme edge of their supply lines and the Carthaginians could always supply their bases and their armies by sea. However, there was a battle outside Agrigento. The Romans won, and Agrigento fell to the Romans. So in 261 BC, the Romans had taken the biggest and the most important of the Carthaginian settlements in Sicily. But there the military operations largely ceased. Only one other large-scale land battle in Sicily, and that was much later in the war. The other Carthaginian bases in Sicily were now reinforced by sea, and the Romans couldn't take them. So you have a stalemate rapidly emerging in Sicily, 
rather like the stalemate on the Western Front in the First World War, the Carthaginians and the Romans were evenly, though differently, matched. The Romans were better soldiers, they had better military organisation, and in any battle with the Carthaginians they would win, but the Carthaginians could avoid battle by sheltering behind their rather powerful fortifications. At this point, the Carthaginians expected the Romans to give up and to insist on a treaty, to insist on peace. And this would be on terms broadly favourable to Carthage. But the Romans had now decided that they wanted Sicily. It was useful because it was so close to Italy that they didn't want anybody else to have a presence there. In order to achieve this, the Romans decided to break with all of their previous history and to build a navy. They would challenge Carthage on the seas. This is a slide on the benefits of sea power, something the Romans took a while to understand, but which they eventually did embrace. If you control the seas, you have a secure overseas commerce. You can deny that to your enemy. You can move and provision armies, and you can prevent the movement and support of, of opposing forces. And the image I've put for this slide is the Battle of Trafalgar, because Britain became a great power, in the first instance, on the sea. Naval power was always the great weapon of British strategy in any war. Britain would not bother with large armies, it would employ the Austrians or the Prussians or the Dutch or somebody else to raise armies to fight wars in Europe. Small British armies would be landed here and there, but the main action was always on the sea, and Britain always won these wars. Britain wore France down in the Napoleonic Wars by landing an army in Spain, landing an army in Portugal in the first instance, moving into Spain, and then supplying this army by sea, whereas the French were at the extreme edge of their supply lines. So in any war which involves crossing water, a naval power will have the advantage. Carthage had been the dominant naval power in the Western Mediterranean for many centuries. Carthage expected that it would win this war because it would necessarily be fought with bodies of water to be crossed. But the Carthaginians did not expect that the Romans would take to the sea. But um, since I'm showing an image of the Battle of Trafalgar, it's worth pointing out that from about 1800 onwards, the French media, closely controlled by Napoleon's government, mm -hmm insisted on referring to Britain as the modern Carthage. Interesting propaganda. It helped to reinforce Napoleon's view of France and the general French view of France as the new Rome. And because Carthage did eventually lose its wars, despite its initial advantages, it helped to cheer up the French. Britain was the modern Carthage. Britain had swept the seas clean of French commerce but just like the ancient Carthage, this new Carthage would eventually be overcome. That's another matter. When the Romans first took to the seas, it was a disaster. The Romans had no experience of fighting on water. The ships they built were heavier and slower than the Carthaginian ships. The first encounter was, I'll repeat, a disaster. The Romans built 120 copies of various Carthaginian warships. They were decidedly inferior copies, and at the first naval engagement of the war at Lipara in northern Sicily, the Carthaginians destroyed the Roman fleet and actually took a Roman consul prisoner. Then the Romans did something remarkable. They accepted that they were inferior shipbuilders, they accepted that they were inferior sailors, but they would adapt naval warfare to suit their own particular advantages. 
The Romans built another fleet, a rather better fleet, and they trained this fleet in the great lakes that you have in the Italian hinterland. They got their fleet ready for going out to sea again and meeting the Carthaginians, but this time the Roman ships had a new piece of technology, the Corvus, and there's a picture of it here. It's a bridge, it's a hinged bridge tied to a mast. The Romans would not try to ram Carthaginian ships because they weren't fast enough and their ships probably wouldn't hold up if they rammed an enemy ship. What the Romans would do was to sail alongside a Carthaginian ship. They would then bring this corvus, this hinged bridge, down onto the Carthaginian ship and you'll see that the corvus has a big spike at its end. So they would let this thing come crashing down, fix itself to the deck of the Carthaginian ship. Roman soldiers will then march across this bridge and fight as if on land. Polybius is very impressed by this development. Once the ravens were fixed in the planks of the enemy's deck and grappled the ships together, if they were broadside on, they boarded from all directions, but if they charged with the prow, they attacked by passing over the gangway of the raven itself to her breast. The leading pair protected the front by holding up their shields, and those who followed secured the two flanks by resting the rims of their shields on top of the railing. The Romans attacked a large Carthaginian fleet at Melai, another place in Sicily, in 260 BC, and the Romans won a complete naval victory. The Romans destroyed Carthaginian naval supremacy in that region for many years. Carthage did remain powerful on sea, and it was able to defeat Roman fleets now and again because of their superior naval construction and their superior naval tactics and the higher quality of the naval personnel. But this was a wasting asset. As the Romans became more and more experienced on sea, they became a match for the Carthaginians and eventually more than a match. Indeed, the Corvus was a short-term innovation. It helped cancel the Roman inferiority at naval warfare. After a while, the Romans were at least as good and often better than the Carthaginians, and this Corvus, this technological innovation, was quietly withdrawn. And you see, because of this stalemate in Sicily, the Romans were able to win land battles, but the Carthaginians preferred not to fight land battles. Because of this stalemate in Sicily, the war moved progressively onto the seas, and the Romans progressively overcame their naval inferiority. They overcame their inferiority to the point that in 256 BC, the Battle of Echnomus, the greatest naval battle in history, in terms of men engaged on both sides. I believe it was about 290,000 men in total fighting in this battle. A Roman fleet of 330 warships and an unknown number of transports sailed from Ostia, the port of Rome. The idea was to cross into Africa and take the war to Carthage. The Carthaginians got wind of this and they assembled their own fleet of 350 warships. So these two large navies with a total personnel of perhaps 290,000 crew and marines met at Echnomus and it was a total Roman victory. The Carthaginians suffered a wipeout. Oh, and there's a black and white image showing the Corvus in action the Romans have fixed this bridge into the deck of a Carthaginian ship and they're marching across and fighting as if on land. So the Romans have won an overwhelming naval victory 
that has wiped out the Carthaginian fleet. It looks as though after eight years of war, the Romans will be victorious. They will land an army in Africa and they will lay siege to Carthage itself. It all went very well. The victorious Roman fleet landed a Roman army in North Africa. This was led by the Roman consul Regulus. The Roman fleet then returned to Sicily, leaving this large Roman army. But then things began to go wrong for the Romans. Once they were on Carthaginian home territory, the Romans found that the Carthaginians were capable of fielding competent armies. And the Carthaginians used elephants. They used war elephants. The Romans had never seen these before. They had no experience of fighting against elephants. They were the ancient equivalent of tanks. The Carthaginians won a series of important military actions against the Romans. Even so, the Romans did take Tunis, which is about 10 miles away from Carthage, and they were ready for a march on Carthage itself. Now, this is nine years into the war. The Romans had started this expecting that it would be a quick smash-and-grab raid on Sicily, and they could then withdraw to celebrate triumphs in Rome and to march through showing all the pretty things that they had taken in Sicily. The Carthaginians had started this war expecting that they could shelter behind their vast fleets and carry on with business as usual and eventually there would be some kind of peace agreement more or less favourable to Carthage. But after nine years you have giant navies and giant armies and large battles and now you have a Roman invasion army just 10 miles away from Carthage. This has turned out to be a war on completely unprecedented scale. There had never been a war in the history of human civilization on this scale taking place over so long a period and it was progressively driving both Rome and Carthage towards bankruptcy because wars are rather expensive. But although the Romans had invaded North Africa, things now turned bad for them. The Carthaginians employed a first-class general, a Spartan called Xanthippus. He turned up with a Greek-trained army of 12,000 infantry and 4,000 cavalry and a hundred elephants. He turned this army loose on the Romans and cut it to pieces. The Romans were defeated at the Battle of Tunis and the Roman general Regulus was taken prisoner. But there the Carthaginian advantage was allowed to dissipate. Xanthippus didn't like his paymasters, indeed he was frightened of them. As soon as he could, he took his agreed pay gathered up his soldiers and got them back to Greece as quickly as possible and never came back. The Romans managed to evacuate the survivors of this failed invasion and they won another big naval victory. On the way back to Sicily, however, this large Roman fleet hit a storm and I mentioned this earlier, the storm sank 384 out of 464 ships and 100,000 men were lost, the biggest naval disaster in history. Nothing even in the giant wars of the 20th century comes close to that in terms of naval warfare and naval disasters. But even though the Romans lost 100,000 men, the large and growing population of Italy was sufficient to replace those men and the wealth of Italy was sufficient to rebuild the Roman fleet. You then have some picturesque stories. Marcus Attilius Regulus, consul, he's the man who was taken prisoner by the Carthaginians in this failed invasion. He was held prisoner by the Carthaginians for a couple of years. Then the Carthaginian government had the bright idea of sending him back to Rome. They made him promise we're sending you back to Rome, we want you to 
put these peace terms to the Senate, and if the peace terms are rejected, you must come back, of course, but we do expect that the Romans will accept these rather generous and highly sensible peace terms. Regulus turned up in Rome, walked into the Senate, explained what was happening. He then said, I advise you to reject these peace terms. I've lived in Carthage for a few years. I can tell you, they're running out of men, they're running out of money. I think we're going to win this war, and we're going to win it completely. So reject these Carthaginian peace terms, which the Senate promptly did. Regulus then said, oh, and by the way, I'm under a firm promise to go back to Carthage if, if you reject these terms, so I'd better make my way back to the ship. The Romans said, oh, this is monstrous. They won't be at all pleased with you in Carthage. But Regulus said, a Roman's promise is his bond, and I'm going back to Carthage. And the story is, he went back to Carthage, and he was tortured to death in all sorts of gory ways. There's a medieval representation of his death. He's being pressed between two nail-studded boards. Other stories, oh, perhaps I won't go into them, cutting his eyelids off and leaving him in the sun, that sort of thing. The story, this part of the story is not mentioned in Polybius, and it may not be true, but it was taken as an inspiration to Roman boys. A Roman's word is his bond, and you must always stand by your word. And there's a French painting from 1791, showing Regulus on his way back to Carthage, surrounded by his womenfolk, saying, don't go back, it won't be any good for you, showing the importance of courage and of keeping your word. Another interesting story, one of the big Roman defeats in the First Punic War, the Battle of Drepana, again around Sicily. The Roman consul Publius Claudius Pulcher a rather proud man, deeply unpopular in Rome. Before the naval engagement, the sacred chickens were consulted, and the priest went to Pulker and said, Sorry, but the chickens won't eat. I don't think we should fight this battle. Pulker picked up one of the chickens and threw it into the sea, shouting, Well, if they won't eat, let them drink. He ignored the advice of his religious advisers, engaged in a battle and lost his entire fleet. He wasn't crucified when he went back to Rome, but he did live out the rest of his life under a shadow, let's say. I couldn't find a decent picture of this scene, so again, I generated one with my artificial intelligence engine, and I think it did me proud, didn't it? The end of the war. This is a war that went on for 23 years. I'll say again, it was the largest war in history to that date. It was a war that neither side had expected it would need to fight, but it is a war that went on and on and on, raising extreme hatreds on both sides, just as in the First World War there were burning hatreds between England and Germany, or between the English, between the British and the German people. The hatred between the Romans and the Carthaginians grew ever fiercer as this war dragged on and on and on. Carthage was by now almost bankrupt. Its control of Sicily had gone. It was reduced to two outposts, but the Romans still couldn't take those very easily. The Carthaginians, now out of money, and with severely reduced credit, approached the king of Egypt, Ptolemy, a Greek king of Egypt. Couldn't find a picture of him either, so I generated one, which is rather fanciful, but it's a pretty picture. I said earlier that it would be very interesting to write a diplomatic history of this war, but we can't. But here is one of the facts, a stray fact from a 2nd century AD Greek historian, Appian, both Romans and Carthaginians were destitute of all money, and the Romans could no longer build ships, being exhausted by taxes, yet they levied foot soldiers and sent them to Africa and Sicily from year to year, while the Carthaginians sent an embassy to Ptolemy the son of Lagos, king of Egypt, 
seeking to borrow 2,000 talents, that is about 60 tons of gold. Ptolemy was on terms of friendship with both Romans and Carthaginians, and he sought to bring about peace between them, but as he was not able to accomplish this, he said, it behoves one to assist friends against enemies, but not against friends. There you have a stray fact, which indicates that the war had disordered matters, not only in the western Mediterranean, but in the east as well. The various successor states to Alexander the Great's empire were watching this gigantic war with close interest. You can expect that there were Roman and Carthaginian embassies in all of the main power centres in the eastern Mediterranean, asking for favours, deterring the granting of favours to others, generally trying to engage the eastern powers into this war. The eastern powers kept very carefully out, and Ptolemy, the richest and perhaps the most important of the kings of the day, kept out of the war very, very carefully. But it may be around this time that the Romans had their first serious exposure to Greek civilization in its main cultural senses. It would be interesting to know more about this diplomatic and commercial outreach into the eastern Mediterranean. It would also be interesting to see the circumstances in which the Romans came into contact with Greek high culture in its main centres. Unfortunately, we don't have the sources. Polybius didn't think them worth recording. A great shame. But in 243 BC... The Romans built their biggest fleet yet, and they sent it out. The Carthaginians, with the last desperate throw of those iron dice, stretched their credit to breaking point, and they built an even larger fleet and threw it at the Romans. By now, though, the Romans were better shipbuilders and better sailors than the Carthaginians. They also were better naval strategists and tacticians, and they won an overwhelming victory at the Battle of the Aigartes Islands. At this point, the Carthaginian government threw in its hand. They told their general in Sicily, negotiate whatever peace the Romans will give you. We can't carry on with this. And that was it. The Treaty of Lutatius, 241 BC. You can see that by looking at these two maps. The top one shows the Western Mediterranean at the beginning of this war, the bottom one at the end of this war. You can see that the Romans have taken the whole of Sicily. They've left Syracuse as an independent state, but it is now a Roman satellite. The Romans eventually took Corsica and Sardinia. The map is not entirely correct. That was taken several years afterwards. But the Romans have got what they wanted. They've got Sicily. There is no longer a Carthaginian presence anywhere close to the coast of Italy. The Carthaginians were also required to pay an indemnity of 81 tons of silver over 10 years. They were required to release all Roman captives without ransom, though the Carthaginians had to buy back their own captives. A few years later, when Carthage collapsed into civil war and its various subject nationalities rose against it, the Romans demanded a revision of the treaty. They took Sardinia and Corsica. They also demanded another 30 tonnes of silver. The Carthaginians felt rather badly treated by this treaty. However, when you bear in mind that the Romans had won, the Romans had defeated the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians had no navy and no means of building another navy. The Carthaginians also had no army worth mentioning. The Romans had won the war in the military and the naval sense, and yet the Romans left the Carthaginian Empire almost completely untouched. They were able to keep all of their territories in North Africa and Spain, and over the next few generations, they were allowed to expand their territory in Spain. 
the Carthaginians were also allowed to keep most of the smaller islands in the western Mediterranean. They were even allowed to keep Malta, which is reasonably close to Sicily. And Carthage was completely untouched in its commercial operations. It was all considered, bearing in mind this was a war of 23 years and that the Romans won it with a series of crushing victories, a very generous peace to the Carthaginians. But there are treaties which just don't work. The Treaty of Versailles didn't work because it was so harsh to Germany that the Germans wouldn't forget it. But it was also so generous that the Germans would be able to recover in due course. It was the same with the Treaty of Lutatius. It was a surprisingly generous treaty, but it wasn't generous enough for the Carthaginians, and the Carthaginians regarded this as a dreadful humiliation, and they did expect that when they recovered, they would come back to try their luck again with Rome. The important outcome of this war is that Rome was now undeniably the greatest power in the Western Mediterranean. It was now the preeminent naval power, not only in the Western Mediterranean, but also in the East. It meant that even though Rome had no particular ambitions in the East and no particular ambitions in North Africa, it had the means, it had the military and the naval means to intervene anywhere in the Mediterranean world that took its fancy. At the beginning of this war, Rome was a land-based power in Italy, and its ambitions were purely Italian. At the end of this war, Rome was the greatest power in the Western Mediterranean, and potentially in the Eastern Mediterranean, and it had the military and naval means and the confidence to begin to expand its power outside Italy. Indeed, its first overseas conquest was Sicily, and the organisation of Sicily as a Roman province was the template for the organisation of all later provinces in what now became a rapidly expanding overseas Roman Empire. So the greatest war in history to that date an overwhelming Roman victory, a very generous peace, which unfortunately for both sides allowed the Carthaginians to recover rather quickly and to come back for second helpings, but undoubtedly the beginnings of Roman expansion into what became the Roman Empire. Now, I'm not a great lover of military history, so I've tried to avoid saying too much about those sides of things, but... Does that give a reasonable overview of the causes, the progress and the effects of this first war with Carthage? And if anybody has any questions to ask, I will try to answer them.